Foundation. Um, I'm Melissa Nez, your project and community manager. And I'd like you to welcome you to the first of nine webinar lessons we're putting on. They're designed to help the Islandora community understand and develop an Islandora claw. And I just want to let you know right now that these sessions are being recorded so that you can view them again later. So the Islandora Claw project got its start last January. Uh, back then it was called Islandora 7.x-2.x, which was a bit of a mouthful. And we came up with Claw in the interim to uh, make it a little easier to talk about. Uh, we got it started not long after the first official release of Fedora 4. So with some financial support from several of our Islandora Foundation member institutions, the Foundation contracted Danny Lamb to act as our technical lead and build a new version of Islandora that will be compatible with Fedora 4 and take full advantage of all of the new tools that are in Fedora 4. York University donated uh, Nick Rouet's time to act as our project director. And for a long time, Danny and Nick pretty much were the Islandora Claw project. They spent about six months designing and building and testing an initial prototype, and we got to show it off a little at OR and then unveiled a sandbox at the Islandora conference last August. Since that point, we uh, have moved the project into the hands of a larger group of volunteers. So there are five official committers on the project right now, five people who have committed code in Tylodora Claw. And we have monthly sprints to keep development going now that we're no longer uh, using funded development. So we really want to see that group of sprinters and developers expand, and we want to have more institutions take a hand in shaping what Islandora Claw is going to be. So uh, Diego Pino, one of our five Claw committers, came up with the idea of giving Claw lessons, how to develop in Claw, how does Claw work, introduce you to the background. Uh, so he has built up a series of nine webinars, and uh, we're really very appreciative of all the work he's put into this. And uh, we're going to show you how Claw works, how its various, various layers work, how the tools work together. And we're very hopeful that by the end of these lessons, you're not just going to understand Claw a lot better, but you'll feel confident stepping in and making your own changes and contributions to the stack. Because this is very much a project that belongs to the Islandora community, and everybody is not just welcome to contribute. We need you to contribute to get this thing into a, a production-ready state. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to our CLAW project director, Nick Ruay, and he'll give you a few more details about why we're here, who's hosting us, and what we're going to do over the next nine weeks. Nick, it's all yours. Thanks, Melissa. You kind of <clears throat> really nailed everything I wanted to nail. Um, but first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Scholars Portal and Oakle very much for, for allowing us to use this infrastructure uh, to, to take care of all of these. Uh, when, we started this, when, when Diego brought us this idea, we, we thought maybe like nine or ten people would show up and we could get away with using Google Hangouts. But apparently it was really popular and we've pretty much hit the 50 person limit for, for this instance of a, a, Adobe Connect. So uh, my, my sincerest thanks and gratitude to uh, Ocal and Scholars Portal and, and Sabina. Uh, thank you and, and also to Jacqueline who was not here right now. Um, so, um, Melissa pretty much summed up like what we're what we're doing, what the purpose here is is uh, we're trying to grow uh, uh, the claw community, and we've kind of hit restart on the community. Uh, we've tried to, if, if you've heard me or Danny uh, uh, talk about the claw project over the last year or so, uh, a lot of it was just about um, just starting over and hitting reset. We hit reset on everything hit reset on like how the community works around this and we're, we're trying to make this more of a community ownership over this project and it's not something that's just like fully baked and, and transformed and ready so we need uh, uh, your help uh, to, to finish this and move it forward but then at the same time we also understand that it's really hard uh, for people to step right in and work on this project because it's so challenging the, cha the, the whole entire stack there's a lot to it and there's a lot of moving parts so we can't expect a bunch of magical unicorns to show up and just be like hey we're gonna we're gonna rock on this project um, so Diego noticed something and Diego volunteered to do this and I will I, I will forever be grateful to him for doing this uh, because I, I couldn't do it myself um, so the goal of like over the nine weeks is to, to introduce you to uh, particular components of the stack uh, and then 
slowly build up to like this is what everything that we're doing so that you uh, if, if you're a developer or if you're a person at an institution can, that can help uh, in terms of providing like financial resources to the project or developer time to this project uh, you'll have more confidence in, 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 in <clears throat> giving those or, or providing those assets um, so that said echo um, it might be Diego's mic. Uh, so that said, getting back to my train of thought, um, uh, 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 yeah, so uh, we, we want you to be a part of this project. If you have any questions about how to contribute or work on the project, uh, don't be afraid to ask me. I know I can look like a scary, gruff guy, but um, I, I'm more than happy to to help hold your hand through this this, this project. Um, so that said, I'm going to introduce Diego. Um, many of you know Diego from the mailing list. Uh, Diego uh, uh, was previously a part of the the, the Riona project in, in Chile. He's built a wonderful uh, uh, system down there. Um, lots of great uh, uh, work, uh, and most recently uh, he's he's joined Metro.org, uh, New York City. Uh, Library Council, and he's already doing great work there. Um, he's a committer for the Island Or 7X 1X project, and he's a committer for the Claw project as well. Um, and he's a really wonderful human being, and he loves dogs. <laughs> um, so that said, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Diego. Thank you very much, Melissa and Nick. Uh, well, I'm just a human being. Uh, the whole idea of doing these lessons is to introduce you to the catacombs of digital preserving and bring you back alive. And by doing this, allow you to interact with what we're doing right now on the Islander Claw development and to give us also not only code and time, but new ideas and approaches on how we should develop and interact with the community about this. Uh, in the last few weeks, I have been trying to explain our people what we're doing, and I always have this like bottleneck that starts with what we're running over. Basically, what is Fedora 4? How Fedora 4 works? How Fedora 4 understands our assets? So basically, what, what I want to do here is to introduce you to some familiar concepts, but also some new stuff. So if we get this, what Fedora 4 is, what Fedora 4 can do for us, everything we do afterwards will be a lot easier. Uh, I tried to do this as smooth as possible. It has some very detailed info, very, very heavy technical details. But we will start by defining what we have right now. So what we know. Basically, we live in a world where Fedora 3 is our master. And this is what a normal stack of Fedora 3 looks like. We have this Tomcat, where everything runs on. And we have this Fedora 3, well known. And we have like this active MQ that gets messages from Fedora. And we have G-Search, very difficult to install and to make it work, and we have Solar for fast searching, and we have our resource index, Mulgara. And everything is tied to Tomcat. And then we have, like in the data layer, this little guy named Digital Object. And it lives inside Fedora, and Fedora has a way of identifying it, known as a PID. And in this case, it's like a namespace and some very cool UID. You already know this, you probably work with this every day, and it's nothing new. This is a little workflow of how we work right now using the Islandora stack and everything behind. And when we want to ingest something inside Fedora, basically we have like this idea of something, and it goes inside Islandora via form or whatever, and then Islandora builds this digital object and messages it and make some derivatives or whatever and then it goes to something named Tuke. It's a library that communicates to Fedora 
and Fedora gets our object. And then Fedora says, hey, this is an update. So I will put whatever I can make of RDF into a resource index Mulgara, and then I will send a message. And then you search to zero in these messages and transforms this, gets information from Fedora back and into Solar. And basically everything inside our stack works that way. And if you see, it's like pretty sequential, except for the ActiveMQ part where events are being published in this topic or queue, depending on how you configure it. And we have like this async you search that is able to index into Solar. Nothing new here. So let's make a quick review of our old friend, the Fedora Digital Object. Basically, this guy is an aggregation. It's encapsulated, and everything is tied to it. So we have this PID, which is local. We have mostly an XML representation of it. And data streams are basically slots for extra data that helps us define better this object. And this guy can relate to others using also data stream named rel ext, which is basically RDF. And internally, each of these data streams relate to each other using rel int, which is also RDF. And we can see this Fedora digital object also as an instance of a class. This is, well, mostly. I will explain why. Well, <clears throat> if you see here, with a little help of Mugara, we can make these objects chained and interlinked. And when I told you about this instance, basically we're telling that our objects can be something in our own Islandora or Fedora notion. So we can have like an object that is a collection, one that is a book, and that book is related to our objects named pages. But our C models, we name them like that, are pretty much like a blueprint, like the blue one there. So we're telling them what type of data streams each object can have, and not much more. In a normal object-oriented programming view, classes are really not objects. And in our case, C models are objects. And also, the meaning we give to these little fellows is really local. So a page is a page inside our context. We have software that can understand it as a page, can display it as a page. But if we move this object to another space, to another domain, basically we are just telling them this guy has some data inside, not more. So, that was Fedora 3. I think you already know that. Yet, some of that stuff is pretty well known. Let's start with Fedora 4. This is a new world. And Fedora 4 has a pretty cool architecture. It's not monolithic anymore. So, it's like a pluggable API. And we have these different layers, and each layer fulfills a different need and can be fine-tuned to work under different scenarios. So we have like this Fedora 4 services layer that provides outside world services. And we have like this RESTful API there connected. And then we have like this mode shape layer, uh, which, by the way, can or will change in the future, but you don't have to take care of that right now. That provides right now the real repo services. It's GCR 2.0 compliant, and it deals with all your preservation needs. And then we have this R1 named Influence Pan that does caching and has some data grid capabilities. And at the end, we have like this persistent storage. And the old known guy named ActiveMQ is still there. Means we still have some events, but in this case, events are a lot more important than before. 
it's good to know that our API hides at certain degree most of the lower layer complexities. So if in the future Fedora 4 changes, you will still be able to access your sources, your assets, or whatever you want to, to name them in the same way, using the same protocols and in the same structure. This is very important. And so let's go to data. In Fedora 4, that one lives inside mode shape. And I will explain what mode chip is, even when it will change in the future or not change. Depends. It's basically a hierarchical in memory database. And it's super fast. And it's safe. And it implements these all repo services. And one of the very important things about mode chip is that everything is handled as nodes in trees. And these nodes can have properties. So this guy, the node, lives inside and is connected to ours, and they build a tree structure. Because it's easy to traverse, it's easy to search, it's easy to maintain a memory. And most of the real things in the world can form trees, so it makes a lot of sense. And, well, this node can be denoted as a path, and I will go to that right now. If we look at how inside mode shape things are organized, we have like this root node, and we have this all depending nodes that build this pretty tree. And if you look, node 1 is connected to root via a directed arrow, and then we have like node 2 connected to node 1, and they form this path. This path is a good way of describing this hierarchy. So node is identified by a path. These nodes have properties not shown here. And that means that our tree, the tree that this builds, is directed and acyclic. So we don't have loops. Node tree doesn't go back to node 1. It just ends there. So in terms of semantic and graph theory, this is an acyclic directed graph. That was the most complex part for me to understand when I started doing stuff. Because this is storage. This is how we are storing or describing our data in the lower layers of Fedora. But this is also more. New concept. The resource. The resource is the real notion of our data. Basically, a resource is composed of this node, which has these properties that belong to the repository. We can change them. Also, other properties that you put there by the user. And it can even have like a payload, a binary payload, a file. And this one, this resource, is identified by a path the same as the node, the same notion. It, it lives inside this tree. So I think you're asking yourself this. Why I'm trying to confuse you? Well, basically, in Fedora tree, we didn't care about how data is managed inside, because it was plain, and we had a Cobra, and I know a lot of stuff. But in this case, we can't really escape this notion. It just pops up. And there are good reasons for this. And the good reason is the resource path. Since we know that our data is kept in a tree and these paths can describe these hierarchies, our resources use these paths as identifiers. So this is very important. You don't have this PID that allows you to fetch something. You have a path. So you know, using this identifier, where your source is stored. And also, these paths denote where it is in terms of a REST endpoint. So in conclusion, how we store, we organize our data, pops up to how we reference and access our data. And this is very important. This guy is named some host, some port, flat REST, Grandpa, Dad, me. And he's not only me, he's the whole path. 
So, we have seen that in Fedora 3 almost everything was XML except this rels x and rels int stuff. In RDF, a path is a very good idea and is needed. For those who don't know this, and I suppose most of you already know this, RDF is a resource description framework, which makes sense because we're dealing with resources. And it's very good for describing a resource, means a representation of a thing, and typing it. Basically saying this resource is a book, is a postcard, is a message, is whatever. RDF works with triples, and we can use these triples to describe and to relate to others. So we have this subject URI, some predicate, also known as property, and some value. And we can also say this resource is related to another one using a subject URI, a predicate, and an object URI, again a triple. But RDF is also a standard and can be serialized to multiple type of representations and can be shared around. And it's the base of linked data. So if we go back, we see this path is an URI. So it's perfect for using it inside RDF. But there is more awesomeness around RDF. In the Fedora 3 Alandora world, our notion of something was local. Like, this is a page, but without Alandora and Fedora 3, nobody else could understand it was a page. In the RDF world, we have ontologies. And this is my favorite topic in the world. Basically, an ontology is a very formal way to describe types of things, classes, and their properties and their relations in a certain knowledge domain. And they're pretty cool because you can like build a language on them. You can say this is a book and books have pages and pages are numbered and books also can relate to a library and whatever you want to do with them. And you don't have to invent them because there are a lot of cool ontologies around. And if you want to invent them, you are free to do it. So basically our concept of what a book is can be shared and understood by humans and machines. And inside this Fedora 4 world, and in, the, in, in generally in the RDF world, resources can be, really be a lot of different types at the same time. And since we are dealing with this class idea, a resource is really an instance of a class, so it's also an object. And so we go back to this whole idea, the first idea of how Fedora thinks, saw things. So I'm using here very simple explanation of how you write something like that. So we have this first URI, resgrandpa.me, that is of RDF type, a Fedora for repository resource, or simply that pad, a Fedora resource. This is real RDF in text total format serialization. I told you it, there are different serializations. If you look at this, we have like this one. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. There, again. Well, uh, you have this REST grandpa.me that is a LDP resource, LDP container, and schema book, and a Fedora container, and a Fedora resource. Different types, different classes, instances of different classes, multiple objects at the same time. And we have these properties, these triples that define a title and, and some Fedora managed ones like created by, created and then something in the domain of schema named author, and then an about, and another lot of cool stuff. I don't want to go deep in this, but this is how our resource looks like inside, naked. So, 
with this notion, we have different type of resources on Fedora, and they have different type of meanings. Every resource like this, my grandpa, my dad, me, is of type Fedora resource. And then, depending on what content we put inside, it can be a Fedora binary or a Fedora container. And then, on another layer, there's something named LDP. We'll go to that in the next slide. And in LDP, it can be, if, it, if it's binary, an LDP non-RDF source. And if it's RDF and has metadata inside, an LDP RDF source, or uh, you can read that. And then we can keep extending this using user semantics. So we can put there a schema book or whatever other ontology defines something that we want to denote for this resource. So LDP. What is LDP? Linked Data Platform. Well. There is a lot about LDP in internet, and you can search on this, and you will find these long documents explaining all the insights about that. But basically, it's a way of making something complex easier. If you want to write RDF directly by hand, sometimes you have to have the full notion of what you have before to what your current resource is linked to and to what type it belongs. And you have to check for what properties are defined in ontologies. Basically, LDP provides this web-based architecture for reading and writing these linked data resources. And Fedora 4 implements it fully. So that is the reason we can use these URIs to do stuff directly on resources. It adds on resource discovery using something for your nose approach. Basically, you are seeing a resource, and you can see to what is linked, and push a link, and go into that resource, and go further into this tree. And some type of resources are understood as containers. I will go into that briefly. But the most important thing about LDP is that LDP can magically manage triples between resources. So it helps us building this RDF. So LDP provides a service over a resource. And we have this different type of LDP containers that do stuff. I will try to explain this as simple as possible, because this is not so simple. But when you get into this, you will find it so useful that you won't be able to get out of it again. Basically, we have this rest fruits bananas already living inside Fedora 4. And it's defined as an LDP container. This one, the LDP container, is the basic one. Everything inside is an LDP container if it's not binary. And we want to put something new inside Fedora 4. And this new stuff is a little snippet there, that little guy up there, that is a Yumi banana. Yumi is an ontology I made up. And we're defining this new guy. That's the, uh, the notion for a new resource. It's like pretty self-explaining. And this new guy will be a Yumi banana. And it has like this DC title, extra creamy. And we will post this information into rest fruits banana with something named Slook. Slook is a way of saying Fedora hey, I want my new resource be named green banana inside rest for its bananas. If Fedora can use it, it will use it. If it's already a green banana there, it will make up something for you. If I post that, I will get this new resource contained inside rest for its bananas named rest fruits bananas green banana and it will build a new relation for us named LDP contains. This is the base one. There's nothing very cool for this. But it's a tree builder helper. So it allows you uh, you and us to put new stuff inside existing resources and link them. And 
this property LDP contains becomes server managed. Means if I remove green banana from the repository, I also get this triple removed from rest fruits bananas. Rest fruits bananas doesn't end with a dead link, it removes LDP contains. So this is the basic one and it's very simple to use. Then we have one named the LDP Direct Container. The LDP Direct Container in this case is based on two existing assets. We have REST Fritz Apple existing in our repository and we have this one named REST Basket. And this one, the first one, REST Fritz Apple is a direct container and it has two additional properties. One named LDP Membership Resource that points back to REST Basket the second one, and, and has member relationship. And that one is named Jumi Keeps Fresh. So if I take again this apple and it put inside REST for its apples using a post with the same slug, what I will get is the same as before, like red apple is contained inside apples and LDP contains is created, but I get something new. I get also that REST basket, using the property I had defined before in the direct container, is connected to this new one. So we have here some very cool stuff. Basically we are breaking this default tree concept because we now have like these two parents for Red Apple. But we are also having this property server managed. If I remove red apple, red basket doesn't link anymore to red apple and fruits apples doesn't link anymore to red apple. Very cool. And the last one, the indirect container. This one will be used a lot by the Claw development and you will see how useful it is when we try to build something that is contained by multiple different objects at the same time. Now I have three existing assets. I have these fruits berries, I have a, the same basket, and I have somewhere else a rest blueberry bush with one blueberry still hanging in the bush. If you look, the, the first one has a new predicate there. It's LDP inserted content relation, you meet the berry. And it's also noted as LDP in the red container instead of the red container. And the other ones are already sitting there. Well, if I put something new inside rest fruits berries and I give that one the same predicate as the one used in berries, LDP inserted content relation, you meet the berry, pointing to my blueberry here. If I look at Jumi the berry, points to that one. What I will get is this. Same as before, this new one, first berry, is contained by Restfruits berries. Nothing new. No, this new one points to Jumi the to the blueberry one using Jumi the berry. It's like a sim link that Fedora is smart enough and now makes a direct connection between the basket and the blueberry. We are breaking the tree concept again, but now we have control of how these new triples are being created because I'm giving them a subject, a predicate and the object at the same time. And still we have this property server managed. If I remove this first berry, this stop object, because it doesn't really need to have any data inside, I also get the relationships removed. This is cool. And this is used, for example, to allow an already existing object to belong to multiple collections at the same time, something we're very used to in the Fedora tree world. So, what we have learned here is that LDP helps us building these relations and we can see this like a self-deposit aid. Let's assume someone at your institution builds this indirect container for you and then you just 
put something inside and Fedora takes care using LDP to build all the new relations and keep them consistent. So we know that our source has this LDP services, but what else does Fedora 4 provide for us? So Fedora 4 is really built to last. It has a lot of preservation capabilities. And the first thing we saw is like we can use these pads, these URIs, to make some stuff on them. So we have like a RESTful API that can allow us to create, read, and update, and delete everything directly there. We also get tombstones, means if I delete a resource, the pad lives still in Fedora. That means if I remove something that is not LDP managed and someone else or our own repository is pointing to that, at least they will know it was deleted. The URI will still be there. We have versioning, means I can make historic snapshots of each resource. And there's currently some development and some conversations about enabling Memento. Memento is a protocol for making access to historic versions easier. And it's very, very interesting. We also have a new way of dealing with authorization, a standard way, named a Web ACL. And this is very interesting because we can put our definitions of how and where and who is going to access our resource also inside the repository as RDF. We have something named atomic batch operations, uh, or people name them transactions, that allows us to start this TX transaction, do a lot of stuff inside that, and when we are ready doing that, commit it. And only in that moment it will be get really written inside Fedora 4, and all the events that are related to that will be broadcasted using ActiveMQ. That means in this uh, atomic batch operation context, everything is true. If I keep using the same uh, transaction and I put something inside of the transaction and then ask for that, I will get the recently added. But if someone else asked for that asset, it's still not there. So it's very interesting because you can do safe operations on that. And then we have Fixity. And Fixity works on non-RDF sources, basically binary. So we can make sure that our JP2 or PDFs are still valid and we get a response from Fedora for that. So we can trust Fedora for. It does the same that Fedora 3 did. It does it better, it does it faster and it does it in a more standard way. But since we still live in the Fedora tree world, we have to tie these old and new concepts. <clears throat> and I will go back to data, because basically we are our preservation people, and we want to know how our data lives inside. And this is probably the most asked question. In Fedora tree, we have this aggregated integral view of uh, an object. It has this PID, namespace number, which is local. And in Fedora 4, we have this resource that is defined by RDF, and it has this pad, which is an ID. And if you want to keep your old PIDs, you can do it, because since it's RDF, you can add new properties, and you can have your own identifiers inside. But the real one, the one, the one that the world understands, is the URI, the path. And in Fedora 3, we had these base properties, a limited set. And in this new world, we have like the base ones that Fedora 4 provides, plus other ones we can imagine and we can reuse using our ontologies. And we had these C models that dealt mostly with structure and 
now we have like this RDF typing. So we're full semantic and we can use multiple types to denote this for different needs. And everything else is RDF. So if we want, we can get rid of XML at all. If we want to keep XML, we can make it a data stream. And a data stream really doesn't exist. It's just another resource that is linked to a base resource. If you look here, this one is one thing, and this one is a little tree. Base resource was description. GP2 is one resource. TechMD is another resource. Tumblr is another resource, and we keep keep going on with this. So, if you want to describe something you have in Fedora Tree, it's no longer one resource, it's a graph of resources. And so, I ask myself, if I go and ask Fedora 4 using the REST API for a source, will I get this whole graph tree up? Well, no. And sad. We only get the current resource and all the resources they are referenced using RDF. Only this space. So if we have like this data streams, we won't see what these data streams look like. And if that is extra information and to another, we won't see all that graph back. It makes sense because a graph can be very big and getting everything once. And if we also have all the linked resources, it can be impossible to manage. So we need some aid. And since this is RDF, we need a triple store. And we had one before in Fedora 3. It was named Mulgara. And it was a very, very, very bad triple store. It was awesome, slow. And it couldn't grow much. So, the question is, where in the first diagram, if you still remember it, but it's still here, was the triple store? Well, it was not there. In Fedora 4, everything that belongs to indexing, to putting stuff outside of this preservation context, goes through an event and messaging interface. And so some very clever people built an Apache Camel toolbox around the indexing notion. So if you see, we have like, like this Apache Camel. Apache Camel is an integration work, uh, um, framework. Basically, it can take something, a message, and split it and process it and make decisions on that and transform it using all the type of processing that all connects together and send it somewhere. So in the current Fedora 4, everything that is indexing is handled by Apache Camel. And we use this a lot in our cloud work. Basically because we get an async workflow. And it's event driven. You don't care anymore about waiting for it being stored on the Fedora side. You just get a, a message from Fedora when Fedora is ready. It goes to Apache. Apache does a lot of cool processing. It goes back to Fedora, asks for the resource, and then sends it to our new triple store. The one we're using, Alandor, is named BlazeGraph, and it's really fast and scalable. And then it can send it also to Solar. And just keep imagining until Elasticsearch or whatever you want. The good thing is you can build these workflows using Apache Camel without knowing to program Java. It's Java-based, but there are all a lot of different type of ways of building it. And it's pretty well documented, and if not, you will get a lot of help from us. So, we have seen a lot of complex stuff that really are not so complex. When we will start working with them in the next sessions, you will see they make a lot of sense. And you will 
surely forget about things are being handled right now on the Fedora tree side because it's faster and it's easier to do and we can really make our resources and assets global not longer local and what we have learned here is that Fedora 4 is really an API what that means is things can change in the future but how you access your resources how you deal with them how you create and remove them will be consistent. And Fedora 4 is RDF based. So XML can live as a site object there inside a resource stored like a GTP2 or whatever, but you don't need it really. Uh, we don't have like this local identifiers anymore. We have these paths and they live in a tree. And it's very important to know that. We have LDP, which allows us to create these trees and make it simpler. We have preservation services. And everything that goes behind that is async and allows us for building this very awesome workflows based on Canon. And really, there's nothing to fear. When I saw the first time Fedora 4, I was scared. I thought, no, I don't want to use this stuff. Because basically, this notion of having the pad that is used to store data, the same as the identifier, made no sense for me. After a few weeks, I was not so scared. After a month, I was really enjoying this. And now I really can go back to Fedora 3. So, in the next session, we will see that this theory comes down to earth on a hands on, and we'll be creating these resources, giving them some global meaning, and using something very cool named PCDM. And I think that's, that is all for today. Can you still hear me? Well, thank you very much, Diego. Um, so we have about 12 minutes left. <clears throat> there wasn't really much that came up in in, in the chat, um, but uh, if folks want to ask uh, Diego questions, uh, now is the time. Or you can ask Melissa or I questions too. Um, but yeah, go for it. Uh, and and I'll moderate the chat as well. And thank you again, Diego. That was that was wonderful. Great. Thank you. And Diego, I can. I assume you can see the chat now. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Uh, the recording will be okay. The recording will be posted as soon as uh, we get it um, from Scholar's Portal. Um, if it can be exported as a file, we'll probably put it up on the Islandora uh, YouTube channel. Um, but if I'm stepping on Melissa's toes, I'm, I'm sure she'll let me know. You will get probably a very cool British voice. The plan, probably. so can't give you an exact time like that. <laughs> Nick, as moderator, would you mind reading those questions out loud for the recording? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so OU Libraries is asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and right now, yeah. Do, do fixities happen over the API layer or internally via the JCR? Uh, thinking about having binaries in uh, Amazon S3 buckets. Uh, let's see. Who is going to answer this first, myself, Diego, or Adam? Yeah. I think Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's related to API, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't tested with S3 buckets because you can have like external content, but API doesn't work over external content, but yeah. There goes Adam. 
and and just to give some folks some context, the the wonderful gentleman who is typing there, uh, Adam Siroka, is a Fedora Four committer and very very active at, and involved in that community. Um, so we have yet another expert here. And I'll, I'll read these out for the recording. Um, so Adam said that uh, uh, fix these, you retrieve fix these from the API. Uh, there are definitely complexities to the implementation beneath the API, but fix D is a fundamental concern. Uh, you will always be able to get the fix D from the API. Uh, and following up, OU Libraries is asking, uh, the question is actually about how Fedora reads the binary, so the non-RDF resource, in order to generate the fixed fee. So Adam, uh, I respond, that, that is uh, specifically left undefined. Uh, we do not guarantee a particular mode there because there's no way to do that. Um, suppose you are using Glacier. Yeah, which means uh, let's talk about it first. Follow up from Oklahoma. I assume it's Oklahoma, not Ohio State. Uh, will it be curl? Will it curl it in if it is external, or must the bucket be federated within the JCR? You will not want the same kind of implementation as somebody using spinning disk. Um, so I think. OU, you're getting at something that uh, I, I will mention uh, that it might be worth getting involved. You might see it on the Fedora mailing list about uh, the asynchronous storage implementation. Um, that's something that is kind of in play, and it's another thing that you can lend your voice to in the, the communities, um, whether it be as uh, uh, providing uh, uh, time and labor as in development, or whether it is standing in as a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, somebody that's like the interested party that will go in and test it and, and provide feedback uh, on the implementation. I've served at that, but I'm losing my words. Stakeholder. But definitely we will, we will try to make some tests using different types of storage during the implementation phase in these lessons. So we can try with S3 and others and play with that and see how people feel about that. And if you see on the mailing yeah. list, uh, um, there's recently somebody who got, uh, got it to work in Azure. Uh, I believe that's the Microsoft Cloud Service. So, yeah. So uh, there, there are multiple compute communities to participate here. Uh, I, I know that might be difficult, uh, but it, it is worth at least uh, lurking and watching. And if there's something that you see that you could provide a voice to or you care about, um, both of these communities are very open to that. Uh, especially in the Fedora 4 community in, in terms of stakeholders and specific functionality. Um, like we really, really need people there for that. Yeah, because there are, there are a lot of edge cases and use cases we haven't tested yet and we haven't come to solution on the cloud side. Basically we are trying to build something from zero that works for the most general cases and then we'll go refining when those use cases get documented. And so having your interaction on this is very, very important. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for uh, Diego, Melissa, or myself, or maybe, maybe Adam? Put him on the spot since he's helping out.
Ah, yes. Yep. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just close out here because it doesn't look like there's any other um, questions. So obviously, I, I assume most people are on the Islandora list here um, because you're a part of this webinar. Um, so the best place to participate in this is uh, you'll see mention uh, about the CLAW project like every Wednesday afternoon. Uh, we'll send a note out saying, hey, we just met. These are highlights of the meeting. Um, so look out on the mailing list for this stuff. Every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, the CLAW group meets. Um, the, uh, uh, the agendas and, and meeting minutes uh, are on the GitHub CLAW page. Um, anybody is welcome to attend those. Uh, you don't have to be like a hardcore developer or anything like that. If you want to lurk, if you want to kind of try to get a handle of what's going on in the project, you are totally fine to show up. It's uh, we use free conference call HD. There's an unlimited amount of people that can that can join. So if you just want to kind of sit and lurk for a while and get your feet under you and say, okay, now I'm ready to participate, that's totally cool. And actually, that's 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 really great. Uh, we we need more people in this this side of the community. We need more voices, uh, uh, and we need more eventually time and labor to move this project forward so we can have an eventual release. Um, the other places to look are, of course, on the uh, Fedora mailing list. There is the Fedora community mailing list, but most of this discussion that kind of centers around, centers around what we're talking about here is the Fedora tech mailing list. Um, and then there are also two IRC channels that you should be aware of, uh, Islandora, uh, so it's pound Islandora or hash Islandora. Uh, both, this is on uh, uh, Freenode. Uh, and then there is also, thank you, uh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, and then FC Repo, um, where discussion is there. And then Adam mentioned uh, on every Thursday uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Fedora runs its tech calls. Uh, and those meetings and agenda are on the, the uh, Duraspace Confluence. Uh, same, same thing as with the claw calls. Uh, anybody's welcome to join if you want to lurk and just kind of get your feet under you. That's totally okay. Uh, if you want to jump in and participate, that's fine. Uh, usually Andrew Wood sends uh, uh, calls for agenda items uh, out to the mailing list if the agenda isn't packed. Um, so yeah, um, please, please uh, get involved in these communities and participate. Um, we can only move forward uh, uh, if we have your voices and your use cases, uh, if they're known to us, and then if you can contribute time and labor, that's, that's even better. These are open source projects, and, and they rely on volunteer efforts. So that's it, uh, unless anybody has any other questions. I'll just pause for a couple seconds. And then if Melissa wants to jump in, she can jump in. Otherwise, I'm going to say thank you all very, very much. Uh, this has been very enjoyable. Uh, and thank you again to Diego, uh, to Scholars Portal, to Sabina and Jacqueline. And, and Melissa for, for organizing this. Uh, and I hope to see you all uh, moving forward for the next eight weeks or so. All right. Thank you and, and cheers, everybody. Yeah, thanks all. See you next week. Yeah, please don't break my heart. Come next week. <laughs>